Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Are You Fishing in the Right Pond session. I'm Laura Patterson with Vision Edge Marketing. I really want to say thank you to the Chat Funnels team, Billy and Alyssa, and everyone who helped bring this session together. And I hope everyone will take away at least one good idea from today's program. A little bit about us, uh, I'm, just in case you're curious, we have been around since 1999. We're predominantly in the B2B space, and we're all about helping our customers take a customer-centric outcome-based approach to being able to grow their organizations. We help them use analytics, accountability, alignment, and operational excellence to attract, retain, and grow the value of customers. We have been privileged over the past few decades uh, to help a variety of companies in a number of industries, and we welcome a conversation with you. A little bit uh, about me, uh, I am at the helm of Vision Edge Marketing since the, its inception. Uh, before that, I spent most of my career in uh, technology and financial services and medical device industries. Uh, I've always perceived marketing to be an engine of growth and appreciate the fact that uh, I've received a lot of recognition about being among the pioneers of the marketing performance management and measurement space. I started my career in financial services as a customer relationship manager. This is way back when, long before uh, the acronym CRM was an everyday part of our nomenclature and language. Uh, so customer centricity is a key part of my DNA. I'm very pleased to have received a patent for our excellence framework, which is a way to visually uh, connect activities and investments to business results. As I said, I spent a good portion of my career in the semiconductor industry, um, where I had the privilege of launching three uh, industry standard architectural families, um, champion some industry segmentation, which is going to be a key part of what we'll be looking at today, and then I led the Powered by Motorola Customer Marketing Initiative. Our new book is Fast Track Your Business, and I hope you'll get, uh, check it out, and you can find more of that on our website at visionedgemarketing.com. So let's get started. We're going to uh, go through three major uh, things today, topics today, upstream and downstream, and why it's important and what they are and how they're different and how they work together. Uh, spend a, quite a bit of time on segmentation because it is uh, critical. You need to be fishing in the right pond and then make sure that you have the right bait on your hook uh, to support the customer buying journey and uh, building out personas. So uh, in Fast Track, we do have this picture. It's our uh, process called uh, Circle of Traction, and it really is designed to help people move through a very organized, structured approach to organic growth. And everything starts with customer uh, and opportunity insights and competitive intelligence. And then we move from there to understanding what are the results that we need to achieve and how will we do that uh, and that's and then segmentation and positioning comes there. So we're going to jump into segmentation and positioning uh, from, uh, and skip those other two in today's conversation. So I do hope you will uh, do a little bit of homework around what those other two entail. This wheel, the circle of traction sits on an axle or a foundation of four critical components, organizational structure and culture, people and skills infrastructure, process and tools, and data and analytics. We won't really get into any of those, but I'm sure all of you can acknowledge how important that foundation is in order uh, for uh, the wheel to turn. So I want to remind all of us that we don't market to buckets of revenue. So any organization that starts off with our success in that they uh, label or create that target around a revenue number already is needing to think about how they're going to parse that number into actual customers, because that's who we market to. In the words of uh, Peter Drucker, one of my fa uh, favorite for, uh, folks, and uh, who I think of as the father of modern management, the purpose of business is to create a customer. And therefore, the more we can think in terms of the customers that we need to create and the people we need to market to, the more successful we're going to be. As Nick Mehta, CEO of Gainsight, is known for saying, the success of your business is inherently intertwined with the success of your customer. So customers are our source of growth. And uh, we need to be thinking about not only who they are and their journey, but what it is they need and want from us or need and want in order to achieve whatever it is 
they will use to declare success. So understanding what success is for the cust your customers is a critical starting point in being able to have success for your company. And that means you need the upstream before the downstream. So if you think of marketing as your growth engine, marketing needs to encompass both of these, the upstream and the downstream. Let's dig into each of these a little, a little bit. So upstream is the strategic process of really understanding and fulfilling those customer needs. And it's not just their needs, but also their passions because pain points and passion points, they're the intersection of those is where the opportunity is for most organizations. And then you can develop these clear customer and market segments, which occurs in the upstream. Analyzing how customers use your product or service falls into the upstream, and then being able to tease out or reveal or surface your competitive advantage in order to acquire, keep, and grow the value of customer. That all occurs in the upstream. If we do that well, then we can go ahead and cast our line into the pond and start fishing because that's the downstream part. And that's all of those efforts that are intended to motivate customers to adopt our products and services, whether they are existing ones or new ones. And the things that we do to get them to come and check out our products and services, whether that's advertising or promotion or brand building, SEO, PR, events, content, all of those tactics and activities, everything that's around getting them to interact and engage with us, that occurs in the downstream. To be successful, you need both. And high performing organizations are adept at using both of these. They're, they know how, they've perfected both of the upstream and the downstream as part of their investment in success. So I wanna talk about upstream a little bit longer and try to make that a, a slightly more concrete. So think of upstream as demand with a capital D. So anytime that you need to be focusing on defining the company's value proposition and positioning, the whole innovation process for sustainable growth, the data and analytics that emphasize customer insights, competitive intelligence, differentiation, segmentation, that is upstream with a capital D. And the metrics there that fall into that part of the work are things like category ownership, customer lifetime value, share of wallet. When we start looking at the downstream, which is demand with a little d, then we're looking at all the things we do tactically to support the company's value proposition, which is a strategic effort. And this is where we're delivering on the programs that support product adoption now. It's a very now oriented view, right? It's casting the line today to reel in a customer now. So the data and analytics are very different. They are much more around things related to activities like content and websites and touch points, email and events or channels, call centers, chatbots or social. And the measures are also different. Measures around visitors and mentions and SEO rank rankings, downloads, contacts, pretty much anything around what we would call calls to action, CTA, because that's our goal in the little d is the CTA. So these two things work together. And in the downstream of D, we have things like account-based um, marketing uh, and uh, lead generation. Those kinds of efforts fall into the little d. So now that we understand the role of upstream and downstream and the fact that they complement one another, what's important to, to realize is that if we don't do the upstream well first, then we may not be in the right place downstream. And that's the key point here. It's really not starting at the downstream, but really starting at the upstream that is critical to long-term growth and success. So that leads us to segmentation, which is a pivotal component of the upstream. So segmentation, uh, Donald Norman, a uh, great guy, love talking um, uh, about some of the things that he's done. Take a look at uh, and check him out. He talks about segmentation is the natural result of the vast differences among people. We're all different. Uh, even things that make us seem like we're alike, still, if you peel the onion, we have differences. And that's where personas become important. So we have to have a way to segment the world. Uh, you know, we, we do it natu naturally, right? When we think about the natural world, 
we put things into segment fruits versus vegetables right those that's a segmentation so we do it naturally and, and we also need to be able to do it in terms of markets so let's make, make sure that we have our terms uh clearly defined a market segment is a subgroup of people or some organizations who have one or more characteristics in common. And there are different ways to segment. So let's just talk a little bit about those. Um, the, the questions that you ask that help you with uh, doing segmentation, and this should be something maybe to take back to the ranch uh, as homework is, what are those key characteristics of your target market? And which of those characteristics do you think should be in common to any desired customer set. So if you can answer those two questions, you can be on your way to doing good segmentation. So if you think of segmentation as slices of the market, the idea is that a member of a segment is going to respond in the same way to the value proposition and have these similar characteristics. If you're thinking of this, then you, what, you, what they would want to consume in terms of content would then be similar and they would respond to that content in a similar way. So this helps you when you're doing downstream because then you can promote the same product to the segments similarly, right? Even though there may be some nuances and different segments, the same product would be promoted differently, packaged differently or in a different channel because of some nuance that distinguishes one segment from another. The reason we do segmentation is it allows us to focus on the opportunities, those prospects who are most likely to purchase our offering. And that's what's really important, right? We don't have time to waste. We don't have energy to waste and we don't have money to waste. Therefore, if we need to keep those things all working for us, all those investments paying off, then we have to be thinking as uh, effectively and efficiently as possible. We need to understand the problem, the user, the purchasing needs and process and the competition. This gives us a way to help uh, accelerate buying. And right now, particularly in the B2B space, I think I just read recently that the buying cycle is somewhere between 138 and 417 days. Days, folks. So somewhere over a quarter and over a year in the B2B world. So how do we accelerate that? Segmentation helps us do that because time is money. So we want to be able to uh, focus on designing actions that are going to motivate purchase. And we want to make sure that the marketing and sales teams and the marketing and sales efforts have are all around a common process and have a common vocabulary. And if we do a good job with segmentation, we can also do a better job with measurement. So it affects how we uh, the products we develop, it can help improve the adoption rate, which is a really important measure, and it drives prices, pricing, channel, communication mix, positioning, and messaging decisions, which are all important in the downstream. So if you want to positively impact penetration and domination, focus on segmentation. Otherwise, if you're familiar with this comma strip, Snuffy Smith, you'll end up in this scenario. So this is Lukey and Snuffy, they're best friends, and they do a number of things in common, one of them, uh, of their favorite pastimes is fishing. And Luke is, Luke is saying to Snuffy in this panel, that's a lot of bait, Snuffy. And Snuffy says, today I'm prepared. Some of the fish bite better on worms. Some of them seem to prefer crawlers and some really go for the wigglers. I figured I'd put out a buffet and see what happens. So if we're not clear about what will what our customers need from us, in order to move forward in their buying journey, we end up with putting out a buffet. And it's an expensive thing to do, right? And again, time consuming, uh, takes a lot more energy and costs a lot more money. So to do segmentation, you've got to look at your market and you have to make a subset. You have to have a process for doing that. And we're gonna go into a moment, a way to do it. You need a process and there are various processes. We're gonna share one with you today that you are welcome to borrow. And it entails analyzing the current customers or prospective customers in a very granular way. So you can have distinct, very distinct segments. So for example, let's pick a B2C one uh, that we all can relate to because we all buy and wear clothes. So retail clothing industry has lots and lots of segments. There's the men's wear and the women's and the children's, right? And then there's sporting and formal wear, athletic, whatever, right? 
there are all different ways that we can segment. And we can have people who move across those segments or people in one segment buying in another segment, for example, a gift, right? Or something along those lines. But it is important to have a way for people to understand, ah, I'm in the, I'm this buyer. I am buying this product or service. This is for me. And it's important that different products are appropriate for different segments. Remember, dogs don't buy, right? Us uh, uh, pet parents, we buy. I, I, I am the pet parent of a small Italian greyhound. She's uh, 13 and a half years old, and she is a very picky eater. Uh, so as you can see, I'm not, I'm not the only one, only pet parent facing that uh, challenge. Farina realizes there's all kinds of uh, pet pets out there with their needs and requirements that pet parents are trying to address. And so you can see all of these different types of products that Farina has brought to market to support different segments, right? Even though it's probably all not all that different. I mean, there are obviously nuances, but we've got all different kinds. So um, just something to think about as you think about your own market and how you might want to be thinking about your products and, and the segments that they are meant for. So there are, as I said, lots of ways to slice. Um, ones that we're all very familiar with are geographically, so by region or climate or size, but demographically by age, gender, gender income. Um, firmographics are also out there. Psychographics, personality, motives, lifestyle, uh, a company that is really well known for supporting lifestyle types, a uh, psychographic a segmentation, Claritas. I think they were bought not that long ago and maybe have a different name, but it's a really great uh, way and view at looking at segmentation by benefits, by usage rate, and uh, in the in the B2B world, by needs. So needs-based and behavior-based uh, segments are ways. And that's where personas tend to come into play, which we will get to shortly. So again, we all are pretty familiar with demographic and firmographic uh, segmentation. I'm, I'm sure you already are using it. Uh, you take statistical data um, that relate to a population or a particular group, and then you figure out different ways that you might want to segment. Uh, those of us that are coming in out of the financial industry, financial services industry, might be by gender, age, marital status, education, right? Might be things we would look at. If we're in a B2B world, we might look at employee size or revenue size or the number of locations or um, different things like that. And then, of course, we have it by industry. You know, what industry we're in. It's like in our company, we are in, we support five key uh, market segments, right? So we have a, a very strong uh, support customer base in technology, financial services, life sciences, medical devices, uh, logistics, and uh, in manufacturing industrial. So for us, we understand that those are markets we can serve very, very well. And they have some things in common and requirements in common in those individual segments. You probably have done something similarly in, in your company. Psychographics are really attributes that are related to personality, values, attitudes, interests. And I'm sure, again, you're very familiar with it. Uh, sometimes this is where you know technology platforms and preferences can come out. Um, where we have PC versus Apple and you've got Androids versus iPhone and Oracle versus SAP and so forth and so on. And then you want to get the right segment. So select a segment of customers who share this common set of characteristics. And then you want to evaluate those and see which of those segments are going to be the best fit. So once you do the segmentation, you're not going to be able to probably pursue every segment, right? You want to figure out which are the ones that make the most sense to pursue. And there, you, know, you want something that's substantial, identifiable, measurable, and of course, accessible. And that will lead us you know, to thinking about your criteria. So give a lot of thought to your criteria you know, around these kinds of attributes. And then you'll want to build a model. So I'm going to introduce you to one way of building a model. And you're welcome to use it. Or maybe it'll spark some ideas for how to build your own. Uh, and there are lots of different segmentation models out there. Our model is going to require you to be, have clear understanding of attributes that you want for your segments. So segmentation models, all of them have to have attributes and that have clear, well-defined breakpoints. It could be number of companies, so one to 50, and then 51 to 100, and 101 to 200, or number of locations, you know, one to three, uh, four to 10, 11 to 20, so forth and so on, number of employees, very clear breakpoints. That's really important uh, in, in any way that you're going to evaluate segments. 
So, for example, just to give you some, uh, construction, not be the number of new refurbished commercial residential, right? Very clear. The number of permits issued might be industrial versus office, could be location, could be size of revenue per employee, public or private. Again, very clear attributes. And for attorneys, it might be the practice types, you know, labor, criminal, estate, corporate, the number of board certifications, the number of offices per firm, or other examples. So these are things to think about in terms of your attributes. It's very important to have attributes to create any model because those are going to define your data sets. Uh, and it doesn't have to be complex. You don't need to make a really complex model. You know, I, I would think of any model, if you're starting from the beginning, think in terms of what do we have to have in order to be successful and then add on to that model as time goes on and you get can get more granular and more sophisticated. So I'll introduce you to ours. Ours involves attributes, weights, and ranking, and three steps. Uh, it has two axes, a vertical axis we call opportunity and a horizontal axis we call accessibility. Accessi essentially opportunity is, is the market large enough for us to go after, right? And accessible is how hard or easy will it be for us to access this segment? Very simple, very clear, understandable terms. Uh, again, we try to keep things in the models that we build to be in everyday clear language uh, that most people will understand. So then the goal here is to look for optimum segments. They are high in opportunity and high in accessibility. Um, and then to separate those into opposed and favorable. So they might have high opportunity, but low accessibility or very high accessibility, but low uh, opportunity. And then those that really should be just taken off the table altogether because they're low in both. So the first step is to define your criteria for each axis, establish weights for each of those criteria, create what we call factors, and then uh, those factors get a value and then do the math, do the research, do the math, and uh, evaluate the segments accordingly. So this allows you to have an apples to apples comparison of seg for segments. This is really important. And I'm gonna emphasize this y'all because uh, we all have opinions about what we wanna do. We all have experience. Those opinions are often based on experience, You know what we did before, what worked before, or markets we were in before, or businesses or companies we were at before and the markets that they served. Opinions are great, experience is great but it, it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison that way. So the beauty of using a model is that it allows you to do that apples to apples comparison. And that is really important in making good decisions. So let's make some examples. Let's assume that for the opportunity attribute criteria is like, is it profitable? Are, the, are these companies profitable? Are they growing? What is their growth rate? What kind of technology platform are they on? And the number of potential companies uh, in that segment. And then under accessibility, it might be domain experience that your company has, the number of competitors that you might have to face, maybe even the size of those competitors or the kind of competitors and the channel. You know, do you have, you know, what, what is the channel preference and, and do you have access to that channel? So let's use that as an example uh, for the, as we might look at it. So here's a, a company uh, that's looking at uh, internal medicine and they're looking at physicians and patients Right, so this is from the medical side, uh, just to give you an example. And you can see what the criteria are and then low, mid, high in terms of factors and then the ratings of those. So we'll just use that as an example. And then we can go and look at these particular types of physicians. So orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, general surgery, radiology, emergency medicine, internal medicine and oncology. And we can see the scoring for each one using the exact same attributes and exact same factors with the same weights and ranks and come up with the score. So now we can see that in this example, orthopedic surgery has a very high score compared to oncology, right? And so as we look that, as we put that together, we can now begin to see where each of those fall into the plotting of it into our, our tool, our, our model, right? And you can see that orthopedic surgery is in the upper right hand quadrant. All of them are because oftentimes we have a general idea of the right segments, but then being able to prioritize those segments because again, our resources are limited. That's where models become really helpful. 
So while all of these seem like they might be really good and they're in the upper right-hand quadrant, we can see that orthopedic surgery uh, is much a much better invest, potential investment than going after internal medicine, even though they're both good. Okay, so that's just an idea of what uh, of how that might work. And here's another example of accessibility and opportunity for another type of market. So you can again see starting off with a pretty good handle of getting rid of the waste right away, and then the thinking actually was in this particular company they thought that oil and gas was going to be optimum, the first one they should go after. Turned out not so. That's not true. That they had an opportunity there, but they didn't really have good accessibility. And in fact, what they could see here is that wow, automotive uh, and mining and aerospace, those might be ones to look at first. And those were not even the ones that they originally thought would be in the optimum um, quadrant. So again, something for you to think about is sometimes some really good surprises. Um, so steps, select a category, choose your criteria, weight your criteria, be sure you get your factors, then select your segments, evaluate your segments, and then make your choice and design and implement and maintain an appropriate marketing mix to go after that, which takes us to kinds of questions or your homework. So start with defining your criteria, establish your weights and ranks, go do your research or find some help to do research because you really, this is a very intense research type of effort, data effort. So if it's not something that you have this, the time or skill set to do, you want to get experts to help you do that. The scoring is really important. Uh, again, it's got it really critical that it's done well and it's done consistently and then make your selection. So how does your customer then move from investigation to, uh, to purchase? So now that we've identified the pond, fishing in the right pond, now we can begin to look at the customer journey. So today's customer journey is an iterative complex pinball of touch points according to David Edelman, and he's right. And so to, uh, we want to understand the customer journey and we find that it's really helpful to think of the customer journey in these stages. So there's the investigative um, stage that starts at the very beginning and we might not even know that someone is in this stage. Then they go into identification, followed by evaluation, selection, decision, and purchase. So let's take a look at each one of those very quickly. In the investigative stage, it is about what is, what's our problem? And people are looking at their problem and trying to understand what is the problem? How did we get the problem? How do we solve the problem? How, who else has the problem? How have they solved the problem? It's all investigative. And in this stage, the most important thing for us as a company is to be discoverable. This is why SEO is so important because the first place people go is to Google and they put in a search. And so if they're gonna go to the search engine or, and put in a search, then you need to be discoverable. But there are some other things that they're beginning to do. They might reach out to some peers in a network or in a group that they belong to. They are friends. Uh, they might, you know, they're doing all different kinds of things. They're not picking anything yet. They haven't made any decision. They're in investigation. Once they have figured out what their problem is, they're now going to look at what are the various ways I can solve this problem. They're identifying potential solutions. They haven't picked a solution yet. They're just identifying all the potential different ways they can solve the problem. And so in this uh, stage, our job in marketing is to create engagement, right? And this is where, where we have the opportunity. So. They've probably been to our site already. Now maybe they're back. Maybe they're downloading some things. Maybe they downloaded it before, but they were not ready for a conversation. They had not made any decision yet. They're just in that early stage. Now they're getting closer and they're thinking about the options. If we're off trying to get that, that meeting right away, we're way too early. Or they're not ready for that conversation. They haven't decided even what they're going to do yet. That happens in the evaluation stage. What solution is best for us? That's when we need to be advisory, not selling, advisory. And then once they pick out their solution, which we hopefully will influence, right? And we hope that others outside of our, but uh, in our network, but outside of our company will help influence that, whether that's analysts or third party experts or members of the channel um, or key opinion leaders or other peer influencers. Uh, then we hopefully they will be selecting uh, uh, the solution providers that are best. Now they're into our category. 
they've decided that solutions like ours are the ones that they want to choose from. Now we need to be in that proof mode and selling mode. This is when they're ready for that conversation. We need to have all the components for that. Then they move into decision. Which one are we going to work with? Now we're in negotiation. And finally into purchase where we move into all of the things that hopefully have components of you know, the contract, the purchasing, all of that. And all along this are opportunities for us to create a positive customer experience through the entire journey. And we need to remember that some companies will move through this process very quickly. Uh, sometimes they will have multiple people moving through the pro process, different people moving in and out. So who might start it might not be at the end. You know, it might, might have been someone that was in the detective mode but an, or, and, and a more junior person. But as it moves through evaluation and selection, they become more peripheral, right? So that's important. And sometimes if in some situations, it's very quick, you know, making a decision about a chocolate bar, you know, going out through the grocery checkout, I'm moving very quickly when I see all the array of options that are there uh, at the checkout counter. It's happening very quickly. There's probably nobody else involved in the decision making. And I have very little buyer's remorse other than the fact that I'll probably have to do an extra run to wear it off, right? So um, it's just understanding that every journey involves these stages, I think is important. Um, so as you think about that from the customer's point of view, think through how the questions they need. What do they need? What would they say if the, uh, is the problem? How would they find their options? How and who do they choose? What do they need from us to, for us to be on the shortlist? Who decides? What do they need to, cho uh, need to choose us, right? So those are the kinds of questions you wanna be sure that you're asking. And we need to match our internal process to that journey. We often don't recognize that our internal process is not matched. We think we've match, matched it. We think that what we have internally matches what they do. But if you haven't really mapped that journey uh, from investigation to purchase, it's hard to put that into your own system. So what we have here is a way to think about that. Contact, connection, conversation, consideration, consumption, and community, right? We want... Uh, to recognize that it's not until probably identification that we have contact. Again, they're not, they're not in consideration stage yet. They're just trying to figure out what is the options that will be best for them. And as they go through and get ready for conversation, that's beginning to happen more in those later stages, those mid stages, you know, that are past identification and moving into, you know, that evaluation stage. So Give that some thought. Make sure your internal process, uh, but both your marketing and sales processes are one process and that that process matches the customer buying journey so that you can then decide which opportunities are worthy, that is to continue to nurture and which ones are ready. And then those that you just are going to discard for whatever reason. OK, so your model and scoring process tell, you know, tells you what stage they're in. Uh, how many of these you need, uh, what the one behavior that's going to be more important that leads to the next, uh, the number of points that you're going to give each behavior, uh, the threshold to determining if it's sales worthy or sales ready. Uh, these are all important in, in deciding how, where they are in your internal process. So your external customer buying journey behaviors become the indicators that you're going to map to your internal process. And so it would look something like this. This is just an example. So they are on social media. They see a SlideShare or a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, that along the way, they encounter a LinkedIn display ad that may be from an analyst report that you were included in. So now you're getting touches. Maybe they're using you have UTM codes, so you can see that they've come those where they've come from, right? Then they come over. They come to a session presentation, like maybe this one at an industry event. Now I can actually capture a name, right? So I now have an industry event with a session presentation. Then that leads to a follow-up. Uh, maybe they download something from the website. I now have more information from them, more engagement, and now I've incorporated them and they've signed up or subscribed to our email or our newsletter. Now I have a beginning a connection that might then lead to a pay-per-click online demo. 
that ultimately will lead to a phone chat. Now I really have interaction that ultimately might lead to a webinar case study and then a full on demo and so forth and so on. So you can see how each of these interactions and touch points and channels work across your internal process and how they tie back to the customer buying journey. So now let's talk a little bit about personas before we wrap up. So personas are important to understand in the customer buying journey because all customers are moving through the same journey. But what they need along the way may be different depending on the persona. So the first business commandment is know thy customer. And I want to talk about three different definitions that are often used interchangeably but are not the same thing. And that's roles, profiles, and personas. We hear them often and we really wanna make sure that we have clear vocabulary here. So we'll use a simple example. We have a number of examples just to help clarify. We won't go through all of the details, but we wanna make sure it's clear to you. So let's look at a CFO, very sort of general title, right? The CFO is a role. Chief financial officer is a role. It exists on an org chart. Um, and you can see that and we know what it looks like. It has a profile, right? And that profile includes average education, average years in their career, average income and their primary responsibilities. That's a profile. The persona, however, tell, gives us insight into other things about the specific types of CFOs there might be. So you could have all the same things in a profile, but very different personas. For example, I could have a CFO who is very much about compliance, all about risk mitigation, right? A very different risk management type CFO versus a CFO who sees their, themselves in the, the role of being a strategic advisor to the CEO, helping set the vision and figuring out the future, right? Very two different CFOs. So the visionary CFO versus the risk management CFO. And maybe there's just another one that's just all about the money, you know, cash flow and and making sure that we stay within budget and you know we uh, are managing our money in a way that makes the most sense for the company. So uh, that would be a different per, uh, persona. There's a third one and you could probably think of some others. So the role, it is the relationship between the buyer or user type and a process and a product. It just tells us about their responsibility in the organization right? Accounts payable, program administrator, whatever, right? Roles don't resemble real people. It's just a, a collection of characteristics, interest, right? Behavior, behavior. They're on the org chart somewhere. And they're very Spartan abstractions. They have some context, they have some characteristics, they have some criteria, but they are very, they're uh, more technical, more formal, and there's just one role. The CFO, one role, all right? Now, a profile has more information, as I said. Now you can, you know, when you're starting to think about the job description, now you're getting into the tasks. What do they do every day? What are the decisions they have to make? You know, what? who are the people they have to interact with? Those kinds of things are all part of the profile. That's not the same thing as a persona, right? So the, you can take profiles and you can create segments out of them, right? So the number of users or buyers and you can create uh, for a profile. The general responsibilities and activities you can put in a profile. You can have uh, different skill sets, expertise, right? Different kinds of things that can fall into the profile, much richer than just a role. But still no nuances uh, for that. So when you start thinking about personas, now you're actually creating a character. Um, a representative user. It's a figurative model. And this is where you begin to really craft unique personas that are related to a profile and role, right? So the, again, the managerial CEO versus the visionary CEO, the strategic CFO versus the fiscally uh, based CFO, all different. We really want to understand them in a, a way that helps us understand their values, their passion, their pain points, their beliefs, because now we can make things more personalized. And uh, the role might tell us what are, where they are in the decision-making, right? And then you, you can fill out the profile so you can kind of see what that kind of looks like, right? But then 
you can have this persona and they're very different. Same role, same profile. These two gentlemen, same profile, exactly, but very, very different personas. And we would give them a different name because they would have uh, very different requirements. So that's the beauty of personas. Um, this is a lot deeper than most companies can get to. So you start with profiles and move to personas. Just it's important to understand what you really are using uh, in terms of uh, your vocabulary so you understand where you are in your maturity. And just as an example, I'm gonna throw some others out there. You know, there are different personas for people who are retiring. This is really important for people who are marketing to retirees, which is a very large market segment, as you can imagine. So you wanna be able to use personas as a way to segment them. So the, the adventurer is someone who's gonna try something new and different they've never done before in their retirement versus the continuer who might be people who are doing something they did before, but they're just not doing it in the same degree, right? But they're continuing on the work. So whatever they were doing. So these might be people who move into some kind of consulting role or do some of things board work uh, that's similar to what they did in their careers. And so you can see some different kinds of uh, personas. And that's why personas can become very important because when you think about a retirees, it's a it gets very hard to create really valuable segments since it is all, everyone is retired. Yes, you can do gender. Yes, you can do firmographics. Yes, you can do some other things, but you can see how personas can make that a much richer way of looking at, uh, at um, segmentation. Um, I was gonna show some other examples here using nursing, nurses, <clears throat> different kinds of nurses though. These are three different personas, all very similar in education, very similar in roles. Um, they give us uh, insight into how how to market. All right, so two different bloggers, how to market. So while we have two different people doing very similar work, they are going to respond to very different content and very different channels. So how do you make one? Because I've spent a lot of time talking about the, how important they are and the, how they're different from roles and profiles. How do you make one? And you really have to start with asking really good questions uh, as you work with customers and pers prospective customers. So you wanna build out some way, what is it that's gonna be important? And here's a whole list of questions. I'll let this uh, sit here for a little while. Uh, these are all of them. It's not an exhaustive list, but it will really help you begin to think through how could we organize uh, some personas and I wouldn't try to make hundreds of personas somewhere in the neighborhood of three, five, no more than seven, but somewhere around those, that number of general personas can be really helpful to help you tease out, again, channels, content, right? Uh, they might do use different search terms. Uh, they might be looking at different things on your website. Uh, so uh, that would be really kind of an important thing to think about. And that's why companies Think about lifestyle, you know, for example, in the financial services industry. Okay, moving on. Um, nine attributes of a good persona. Re remember we talked about demographics or firmographics early on. You're still going to need that inside your persona. So we're not going to throw that away. We want that information. And we want the information about the job res responsibilities in a typical day, remember? We so we're not throwing away the profile. The role and the profile stay. The tasks that take the longest and those are the most cru crucial or critical and perform the most often. We really want to understand that because in the B2B world, we're going to be getting to behavior and needs-based segmentation and personas really help us do that well. Understanding the frustrations, what do they love about their job? What do they find frustrating? That's really the two important questions. And who do they work with inside and outside? Who do they interact with? The skills that they need uh, as well as the technology and time because uh, in a moment we'll talk about that. And then goals, attitudes, and beliefs are really important. And they you want the ones that they are, are conscious of and then maybe do some digging. These are the key attributes that are gonna become really important because people are going to be uh, looking for things that reflect them, right? That resonate with them uh, as they make uh, buying decisions. Remember in the end, people buy from people. And so understanding who the people are uh, is really important. So seven steps to creating a persona. I really do recommend you start with a cross-functional team. Uh, you put people on the team who interact with customers and prospects on a regular basis, really have interaction, and do the best you can 
to create a profile of your best customers and ideal prospects. Start with a profile. Then make a list of the roles that you would, that um, are encountered during the buying process related to them, right? Then start trying to describe them. So if you were going to cast them in a play or in a movie or a TV show, what is this character? And what? how do they behave? So imagine that you're casting them. You're a casting director. Give them a name. Give them a, a view, right? So when you were reaching out, you know, if you have never done casting before, it's kind of a fun thing to do. But if you had to cast somebody, what would the character be? Flush out as many attributes as you possibly can. Add detail, you know, their daily calendar, their daily life. What is? What do they do every day? How does it look? And then once you think you've got a pretty good feel, you're going to need to validate and modify. And you can validate by going out into the market, but if you have a cab or a tab, a customer advisory board or technical advisory board, this is a great way to do some validation before you, you, you go further out and do uh, any kind of other testing. So those are like seven key steps. Then you want to use them in your marketing, right? Because this is now in the downstream. We're in, we're in the uh, message map development. As we've done our positioning, we've done our value proposition, we've thought about the value proposition as it relates to the customer buying journey, as it relates to the personas. Now we want to get our messages right. Now we are what we're calling the bait on the hook, right? So if you have never done a message map, you're probably going to want to do a message map. And then you want to think about which messages are going to be the relevant, most relevant to which personas. Think about the path the customer is taking. Uh, think about their problem and then let the personas sort of steer the route. You know, use that information of the personas that you have about them to understand what their next moves are going to be and then craft appropriate uh, offers. Uh, so is it going to be white papers or articles? Is it going to be trade pubs or websites? What is it that's really going to make a difference and resonate with them? So I want to give you a real example and show you what the implications are two uh, personas and how what the differences might be. And then we'll we'll begin to wrap up. So this is Bill. He is the owner and a CEO of a growing mid-sized manufacturing company. This is a real a real person. He's in his early 40s. He wears glasses and he tries his best to squeeze in an early morning workout whenever he can. He wears golf shirts and khakis most of the day. He only puts his suit on when he has to. For those of you who are familiar with Austin, you probably have encountered people like Bill. Uh, it's very common here. He drives a late model SUV. He has a booster seat in the back for his four-year-old daughter. He's really time deprived. He worries about managing his company's growth. He wants to leverage technology to increase operational efficiency and customer satisfaction and experience. And he wants to have it to also offset rising costs of doing business, but he doesn't really know where to start. Let's just have that be Bill. And this is Bill. Now here's Helen. Helen's a director of sales at a growing mid-sized manufacturing company. Same type of company. Uh, very similar in size, very similar in, in the way it runs. She's 32, a single, a competitive runner. She's partial to 80s rock. She drives a new BMW convertible. No SUV here with a booster seat. She struggles with managing a dozen salespeople. Many of them are older than she is, 10 to 15 years older. She wants the company to invest in a new CRM system. So see, it's still kind of same kind of problem, technology. And then she wants it to replace a contact management system. They have long outgrown. And she wonders how she's going to convince the company's CEO and CFO to spend the money. All right. So let's say you're a company and you're going to use personas, right? You've got an understanding of Bill and Helen, and you're now the systems integrator that's targeting mid-sized companies like Bill and Helen's, this mid-sized manufacturing company. How will what you know about Bill make a difference to how you market to him versus how you market to Helen and what you do with Helen? So since we don't have time to make this interactive um, and the opportunity to make this interactive, let's just kind of cut to the chase there. We know Bill's really pressed for time. He's not going to come to an all-day seminar. Uh, he's probably not going to show up for an evening dinner meeting because he's got family responsibilities. So what might you offer him? Maybe a really quick 45 minute executive level web seminar that he can attend from his desk or an executive breakfast breeding, briefing with people uh, that are his that he perceives as his peers from other local mid-sized firms. 
not competitors, but people about his same size. Remember, he's 40 and he wears glasses. Um, and even though uh, you, so you, the CEO can even help guide the decisions in, in minute matters, such as brochure or website design. So make fonts big enough, right? Break down key messages into bullet points that he can stand quickly. Uh, he can scan quickly. So you want to think about that. Okay, now let's think about Helen. She's a customer sales director, but she has very different needs. She might be willing to go to a half day seminar on convincing your CEO and CFO to invest in CRM system. She might be willing to look at a white paper and download a white paper that's pretty uh, uh, meaty on how to get salespeople to use your new CRM system. She's younger, she's got this BMW. She'd probably go to a lunch seminar at a hot new bistro in town. And she's more likely to notice an ad or a seminar invitation on social media than maybe Bill might or some other promotional uh, materials, probably in a more modern, colorful manner, right? So two different personas, very different in the downstream. Hopefully that's been helpful as a way to help you understand the merit of the effort of doing personas and how it really has implications for what you're doing when you cast the line. So identify your best customers and their roles, define those key attributes, build those initial profiles and personas, Validate and modify. Cabs are great for that. Tabs are great for that. Weave it into your customer journey map and go fishing. So upon completion of the homework that we've talked about, you'll have to find the right pond. You'll have mapped why and how buyers buy. Uh, you'll distinguish types of buyers and understand their engagement and interaction preferences. So with that, I'd like to wrap up and thank uh, Alyssa and Billy and the Chat Funnels team once again. Appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the the Demand Gen Summit. Feel free to reach out to me. Love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Uh, you can check us out uh, uh, on Facebook as well. We tweet regularly at Laura VEM and always welcome um, email from you at Laura P at visionedgemarketing.com. And if you are uh, interested in learning more about Fast Track and our circle of traction, I hope you'll check out our book. With that, I'd like to close and thank all of you, and I hope everyone took away at least one good idea.